never had this happen before. The uh, tire just exploded. That's that's a first. That was a dumb. Now what what? How did that happen, Jake? What happened was we put in some uh, fix a flat, and then we drove it for like two seconds, <laughs> unaware that the shit inside the tire needed to expand fully. Yeah. And it wasn't quite like full yet, so we stopped and put air in the motherfucker. And as we were driving down the interstate, the pressure got so big that the tire exploded. How do you feel about that, Josh? Um, intrigued, because this is the first time we've ever had a tire just flat out explode. I mean, usually there's a and flat did, or... Did we, we, did we even we notice? We didn't even notice. Yeah, yeah. we didn't even notice. Yeah, I, I, I started driving along and I'm like, noticed that like I couldn't see... I could only see one tire and not a second one. No, we're good. We got it. <laughs> Thank you. Thanks! So, uh... Truckers are awesome. Yeah, yeah truckers, truckers. Truckers have saved our ass on more than one occasion. We yeah. used wood today. Yes. We said yes. wood is a primitive technology. Yeah, see, because this tire was so low, we couldn't get the jack up underneath onto the frame of the what is that thing right there? That's called the axle. Yeah, we couldn't yeah. get the, the, the we couldn't get the jack underneath the actual axle, and because of that, we had to do it over here on this side. Well, it was because of the suspension, the thing was lowering, so we couldn't get it high enough by yeah. raising it here. Yeah, here. So Rob had to get a wood block, hold it there, and then move the jack where it's supposed to be in the first place. And then to make it even dumber, we have a balding. It's balding. Our good right tire now. doesn't have enough air in it. Yeah, there's so a good, the good spare does not have enough air. So so we got to stop gotta somewhere, don't we? Put a balding tire on. Go to a gas station, fill that other tire up, and then change it again. Yes. So we're not done yet. <laughs> I'm glad we brought that wood block. It's like it was a perfect length, perfect height. Rob, Rob uses brain sauce. To Our solve wood this was the perfect length. <laughs> no. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, we're, we're, uh, we're moving on up. We've got two axles now. You know what I hear? <laughs> I hear if you have two axles, you get the ladies. You know, it didn't really even mess this rim up that bad. Not as, yeah, bad. Luckily, yeah. Yeah, that's Not as bad I'm as glad. the last time. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, the last time I like banged into a curb with it. Which they still have not let me live down. Look, look at this. There's nothing left of this fucking tire. Just the metal part of it, yeah. We're really close. We're really close to the border of Oklahoma and Texas, and uh, this is yet the la the latest incident in many in uh, you know vehicle trouble on the road. This is a winner. Right yeah, this is definitely my favorite. It's pretty brutal. I never just see. We never had a tire just flat out explode on us. No, actually, my favorite is still when the tire fell off. Yeah, that's my favorite. But this is my second favorite. Just tire exploding. The tire explode. The tire explode. The tire explode. <laughs> gas station because I got to poop. Is the camera still on? Yeah. Hey, Josh has to poop, everyone. Yes. This is the first time this has ever happened. Hey, show the world the face that has to poop right now. This face is the face of a man who's got to poop. <laughs> I pooped. I feel better. All right. <laughs> Darkness. Nah. Hi. We uh, are officially entering pre-production today. Currently have Josh and Jake rehearsing some guitar stuff. Let's go interrupt them rudely. <laughs> this, I'm just. This is like the first uh, leg of pre-production that I'm showing everyone, and uh, it's officially starting today. <laughs> We're all wearing the same shirts. <laughs> Are we? <laughs> How lame is that? Well, well, it's even lame as I'm wearing a rod for president. Yeah, you're wearing your shirt. With I'm your wearing your my shirt on. with my face on it. <laughs> He's wearing a shirt with his face on it. It's true. Yeah. All of our faces. Well, you have all of the all of our faces. <laughs> What's even funnier that's is that like we're best, just that's the best looking guy. Yeah, yeah. This is not yeah, in bizarro world. <laughs> this is not shameless self promotion. This is just being unable to afford any other shirts. <laughs> hey, they're free for us, yeah, right? They're free for yeah. us. <laughs> That's why I'm wearing it. Yeah, there you go. <laughs> All right, and those are our practice ads for now. We'll be actually having a full band set up in about five days or so. So, Jimmy's here. Is this slow motion? Yeah, sure. Now it is. <laughs>
Nightmares and Dreamscapes. Wonderful light reading for the plane. Then he starts talking to me about, well, what are you doing? Well, I'm coming out to, uh, to Kansas City to pre-produce an album, and then we're going to go to uh, Phoenix to record it. Oh, yeah, you playing a band? What band do you play with? Uh, a band called Psycho Stick. Oh, beer is good. You play in that. What do you do? Uh, I play bass. I mean, <clears throat> I, I sing. <laughs> yeah. And I signed autographs. Dude, but I did I did pull like one of the smart assest things ever. Anthony would have been so proud of me. Yeah, yeah. Like we're sitting there and like plane hasn't taken off yet and this one kid starts and then it starts another kid into and there's this by screaming thing happening with the two kids. So we just sat there and bit our lips, I think everybody on the plane, for about five minutes. And then when they settled down, like it got too quiet. It was like, ah, ah. And I was like, as soon as it got quiet, I'm like, try condoms. <laughs> <laughs> we are up early right now. Early being 10.30 <laughs> to go to Guitar Center. So yeah. what was that? Were you making fun of my being tall again? Yeah, because you, you kind of like, you got like a big cut of, yeah, <laughs> see? The this is, look this nice. is eye level for me. <laughs> Shut up. <laughs> Isn't it very funny how the drummer from Red Hot Chili Peppers looks exactly like Will Ferrell? I was just going to say, is that Will Ferrell on the wall right there? I mean... Wow, he looks just like Will Ferrell. Like, that's gotta suck when you look like Will Ferrell. That I mean, much. he's a badass drummer, too. He's a good drummer. Will Ferrell's funny, though. <clears throat> he's pretty funny. I like Will Ferrell. So he, he's off and on. I think that's kind <laughs> of creepy, though. It's like, Will Ferrell plays drums. Wait, no. Will Ferrell plays drums for Smashing Pumpkins? I had no idea. Smashing Pumpkins? <laughs> <laughs> you, can you show him your old pedals first? Oh, right after this, once we're done, show me the old pedals. I, uh, I am so sick of my old pedals, I brought them out of the room because I didn't want them anymore. So let me move them back in here. All right. <coughs> all right, here they are. All right. First of all, they go together like this. And it's only got one lug here. And this this little flap, the rubber flap, fell off the bottom. It's supposed to be here. Uh -huh. so I just duct taped it so it wouldn't move as much. How is that one pedal held on there? Oh, uh, here's the piece. This is the left half of the pedal. This is supposed to be a proper hinge, like this one. Uh huh. No. Oh, I see. But it broke, and so if you zoom in, that's a nail. <laughs> and I bent the ends in. Uh, that's pretty crafty. Because our good friend in uh, Fort Wayne, Indiana, actually had a bunch of nails, and he helped us out. So uh, yeah, it's held together. The last half of the tour, the last tour we did with Look What I Did and Power Glove. Yep. So, I want to say thanks to Jake and thanks to Basil for letting me borrow their pedals. He totally MacGyvered that now, shit. Now, let's see. Let's the see. new pedals! Let's All see, right. we went from a very good pearl pedal, it was just beat to shit, and I toured on it for way too long. I mean, it wasn't a bad pedal at all. But now, this is, in my opinion, the best pedal in the world. Oh, it comes with its own hard shell case. This is the first thing I asked when we went to Guitar Center. It's like, does it come with a case? I need a kit. Hey, bring it up here so we can get a better view of it. That's a good idea. Yeah. Jake tripped over the other room. Uh. Yeah. It is. The DW9000. These are the shit. Alright, uh, now bust out that bass hey, drum and put it together. Let's see hey, what it Steve. looks like. Hey, Steve. I bought it. Now give me the endorsement. <laughs> <laughs> I know your name. You work for DW. <laughs> <laughs> hey, For those of you that knew about our little fundraiser that we did, where we had fans donate to like help us record, fund this album, I would like to show you some of the things that we purchased with the money that was donated by our fans. Such as this nice little setup here. This is going to be the uh, new Psychostick guitar rig. We have ourselves a BB Sonic Maximizer, donated by uh, Gogi, who lives in uh, Atlanta, Georgia. 
Um, he just flat out gave it. He had, he had one of those and said, hey, you need one of these? I'll just mail it to you. Sweet. Thanks, Kogi. Um, he's in uh, Dear Enemy. Plugged their band. Um, right here we have a uh, Ingle, the uh, tube rack mount uh, 530. Um, this is pretty much the most metal rack mount head. Well, actually, their heads, you know, in general. Engel is the most metal company out there. They're based out of Germany. They're just now getting over here in, into the, to the States, but Tone. VHT, also a very, uh, very respectable company. They're getting to more and more guitar centers. But this is actually a discontinued um, a rack mount version of basically the VHT Pitbull Ultra Lead and the CLX preamps kind of combined into one rack mount for all you guitar nerds out there. Um, I had to find this on eBay because they're actually, because of, apparently they discontinued it, I believe because there's like lead components in it or something. So they're redesigning the new version of this. So this this is, I found this on eBay for an amazing price. Um, the guy just wanted to get rid of it luckily and the thing sounds beautiful. And we have a VHT power amp for, which is going to power both of these heads. So yeah, we have top of the line, Bitchin' guitar tone. There's no other amp that I would want. This is it. All right, Jai, what's what's going on today? <laughs> Tell the world. We're going to bust out the acoustic guitar and record some acoustic stuff. Cooster? Coosters. We're going to get all cooster. Coffee. And that's killer. Killer. To do and kill her. Come here, dude. Come here, dude. Walk on, Laffy Tappies. How many Laffy Tappies? Would you say 24 million? <laughs> <laughs> I have traveled many miles to be here. Have you, would you say you have traveled 10 million miles? So, how do you feel about the new album? I feel extremely excellent. In a most tubular manner. <laughs> Jake, you got your dream amp? Yes, I did. Tell me about it. I love it. So metal, I want to fuck it. There we go. We just finished that song. We just finished that and song. You guys are witnessing right now productivity because we don't have the internet. <laughs> <laughs> What's the name of the song you just finished? The, the hunger, hunger Within. The Hunger Within, yes. Give me a little background on that, that song. What's it about? Song about a deep yearning. For food <laughs> when you're broke. <laughs> so it's about touring. Well, it can be. it can be, but it's more about like whenever your your fridge is empty and like you you still have like a few more days till you get paid. So you're just eating ramen noodles and stuff, and uh, you want to eat real food and the longing for like a pizza or a taco or something. Okay, so taking that theme and being a broke musician like yourself, Josh. What has been your staple food during this time off? I'll show you. Did you hurt me so bad? Hey. Do you feel Tortillas pizzas. Oh snap. Now what's the corn dogs? Oh, that's gross. And chicken nuggets. Okay, now let's real quick. What's what's the price on the uh, Totinos? Totinos pizza. They're like a buck a piece. Yeah, they're somewhere around like a buck. This is Jason. DM's toxic recording or psycho six recording. Jason, how do you feel about that? I feel awesome about it. The sandwich is turning out well. What's your favorite part of the sandwich? Hmm. There are so many good parts of the sandwich. I would have to say the whole sandwich is my favorite part so far. <laughs> and how would you rate Josh as a studio engineer? Josh is excellent as a studio engineer. And even though I said that like it's, I meant it sarcastically, I didn't. It was a video. Get it.
Guinness. Men drink Guinness. <laughs> nuclear iced tea. Girl drink nuclear iced tea. You listen to this, we can record. Hey, killer. You can't, you can't. Yeah. What? Uh, like, like it's in video can't record? No. Nobody can hear this yet. It is of the utmost vital importance that we keep this on the down low. Sorry guys. I blame uh Global Warming. Global warming. What's the instrument stuff? Me! Alright, you and your being right about it. Mm. Alright, Jay. <laughs> well, it's bloody wonderful. Bloody. So, and now we die. Josh, does the, the thing of the song. Alright, turn turn me up some more. Hello, hello! Da, 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 da. A little bit more. La, 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 la. Yeah, there you go. <laughs> no. No, it's good. <laughs> God, this is gonna be, it's gonna be hard to record. Hey, don't forget about me. All right. Die! I like that last one because it has resolve at the end. Uh, don't listen to Jamie. He's trying to distract you. Are we doing the next verse or the, this verse again a couple more times? Huh? Are we doing? Are we doing two more? One more. Okay. They're analyzing my work, scrutinizing me. Planets? Planets? Oh man, it's planets! All right. <clears throat> I wish you could hear what I could hear. It's high fidelity, everything. Like when I take a drink, it's just so high quality and. It's like real life. It's a documentary. Say hi to Gail. <clears throat> yeah, we're, we're gonna cut that. <laughs> we'll do uh, another take of that one. That the two lines are like, that you're using a very different, you know, kind of vocal inflection so that you can really hear, hear the difference. No, I, I said well, for him to use a different it, vocal inflection. It, 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 a different vocal uh, in, in, inference, a different sound for each one. Robert's <laughs> <laughs> about to do so. He's gonna do some vocals now. Vocals now. Vocals now. He's gonna do some vocals now. He is freaking okay. gay. <laughs> it's a lot like the full ladies more off. Yeah. There's a couple places. Jimmy's putting his hair up. Uh, Jake's hair's already up. Uh, Alex's hair is pretty gross. So it's it's normal. It's and there's Josh. There's one down here. Uh, Hacksawing his uh, bandana. It's like a silver I'm always gorgeous as always. Always. Yeah. I don't think he should be in charge of the camera anymore. He'd do the same thing if he had the power. <laughs> Oh, we're all gonna get one of those cameras. The footage is gonna be never ending. Oh, alright. That's fine with me. We have some new lyrics. To don't eat my food. Which is more along the subject matter of not eating my food or we'll kill your ass, right? Damn, yeah, right. And uh, last night, I formatted and reinstalled Windows on our recording computer. And now it works like a charm. Because I'm amazing. So now we can finish recording guitars and bass in like a day. Right? No. An hour. Uh, yeah. All right, cool.
words for the camera? Um. Yeah. Go away. I got four hours of sleep last night. Four hours. Come for I know it's a weird time to ring this up, Rob. On stage, in front of like everybody, but I think I'm in love. Really? And you know, you, these are the type of emotions that you should spill out to everybody in order to make yourself feel better about yourself, right? Isn't, isn't that true? Yeah, that's pretty much what songwriting is all about, from what I understand. Well, would it be cool if we like somehow, because I'm in love with a drink called Jägermeister. Sing along, or you're ugly. 
Josh, you are the uh, the seed of Psycho Stick. Seed of Psycho Stick. <laughs> I like the sound of that. Yeah. So tell us the origin. Starting how far back? Very, very beginning. Right. I guess from the the first song that you wrote, uh, I believe in a band to get chicks. Correct? No. No. What was the first song that you wrote? Plug. Plus, the first song that uh, I ever wrote that became something. Oh, actually, first riff, technically. Then it became a song later. But, uh, well, if you want to know the, the origins, the real origins of Psycho Stick, you have to go back in the time machine to about 1998 when Rob and I graduated from high school. And, you know, right out of high school, we're like, Dude, like we're not in school anymore. Now we can do stuff. So what should we do? And Rob's like, dude, we should start a band. You know, we did that whole thing, the whole, the whole we're gonna start a band and get famous thing. And uh, you know, uh, that was his idea. And we started pursuing that. And then he moved. Rob moved to Albuquerque, New Mexico. Um, and uh, then now, but after that, I was all excited about doing the band thing. So I'm like, screw it. All right, well, let's start a band anyway. So we found, so I found um, three other dudes, um, Marvin, uh, Bozzy, and Steve. Um, and uh, rest in peace, Bozzy. He actually was killed in the, uh, uh, over in Iraq pretty recently. Interesting, uh, side note. Um, but uh, we got together and we, you know, we were a local band to Odessa. Odessa, Texas, population 120,000, I believe. 
and there's you know not exactly abundant opportunities you know in such a small town so we played a few shows as as, as asinine that was the name of what we were called back to um and i was actually the singer of that band i wasn't like that good but i was the singer we had like five songs that we played the only one to survive from that band is pla that's the only one we used to play back then that we still play today in psycho stick so pla was an import from asinine so anyway well rob like during that time moved from albuquerque to phoenix and uh he convinced me to move to phoenix and to like start the band up with him again so uh, I took the idea behind Asinine, which was like me uh, metal with a little bit of comedy, and like flipped it on its head and say, you know, lots of comedy with metal. And then we formed Psycho Stick. Um, we uh, found Alex through uh, Add of the New Times, and then we found a uh, found a bassist uh, through Alex, who I also contacted him through the New Times. It's a publication here in Phoenix. And I put an ad in the Phoenix New Times saying I'm a drummer, I want to be in a band. I was 15 years old at the time, and um, they got a hold of me, Rob and Josh did, and then I had been talking to a bass player named Hunter, and he didn't have a band either, so the four of us got together, started the band, made our first demo, it was called Don't Bitch, It's Free, and then about a year later, he wanted to go do like punk rock kind of stuff, so you know, no tension or anything like that, he just wanted to do something else, so Hunter left and we got Mike in 2001, and about that time, we recorded the dumb, uh, demo Die A Lot. And uh, after that, we were a four piece, the four of us, for quite a while. And recorded, we couldn't think of a title in 2003. And then uh, that's when we recorded our very first album, uh, which is We Couldn't Think of a Title. And, uh, you know, pretty much from there on. You know, you can pretty much see the history in this very DVD that you're watching. Yeah. So. Very good. Tell us how the name Psycho Stick came about. Well, this this uh, question gets asked kind of frequently in interviews, but the band name um, originated after Josh moved to Phoenix, and it was just me and Josh, and. We, we were going with the name Asinine for at the time, and uh, Josh, you know, the internet, he hopped online and started searching around, and there are other bands name, band names with that name. Um, it's a pretty cool band name, I think. And, uh, I was like, man, we need a new name. So, uh, we slept on it, literally. And I, I literally woke up at about two or three in the morning, half asleep, half awake. And the name just popped in my head. I, I have no inspiration for the name. I didn't think of a branch with crazy eyes on it. I, it just popped in my head. And the original pronunciation was going to be psychostic, which <laughs> created all sorts of confusion locally when we, because there's a, there's a song where he said, I'm, I'm in that band psychostic, the original recording of In a Band to Get Chicks. I said psychostic. And then, and we couldn't think of a title, I pronounced it Psycho Stick. So we went with the, the more obvious pronunciation. But the origination was just a you know, random thought, and I went into the living room where Josh was still awake and strumming on uh, my really cheap, crappy acoustic guitar. And I said, hey, uh, I thought of a band name, Psycho Stick or Psycho Stick, I don't remember exactly what I said. Like, cool. And we went with that. That's about it. And uh, as far as the mascot goes, that obviously came after the band name. And uh, I threw it together in Flash, um, just started messing around, drawing circles, <laughs> and then shaping it into what it is. Because the, the program is cool because you can draw a circle and start moving the edges around until you get your shape. And that's pretty much what I did to form the mascot. And uh, I actually have a pretty cool animation of him jumping up and down. And, you know, his arms are flailing, his leaf is flailing, and his, you know, his jewel is flopping back and forth. And I'll probably release that again once we do a, a new teaser for Sandwich or something in the future, so. Very cool. Yeah. It's just like horrible. I think my parents are on the track or something. <laughs> Put that in the video.
documented. He's already recording in school. <laughs> hey, mom, hey, mom, cry. <laughs> so for people who don't know, this is merch guy Tony. Tony doesn't get a lot of FaceTime on the MySpace because uh, instead of his face, it is a death burger. Cause it, yeah, because it'll like overshadow Rob's and he doesn't want my face on there. Because he'll be like, all the girls will be jealous of him or me. Or he'll be jealous of me. Stands the reason. Yeah. So you have been with the band for a very long time. Uh, how did you first uh, get involved? How did you meet? What, what happened? Well, back in, uh, I think it was 2000 or 2001, I used to do like street teams for bands, and I used to do it for this website. I'm not going to say the name because they're a bunch of dicks, but um, yeah, I did a uh, street team for Nothing Face back, I think it was 2001, and so I went to that show over at the Big Fish Pub over here in Tempe, and Rob and Josh were there. And I don't remember how I started talking to them, but they were sitting at a table, and I remember we were just talking about it, and they said they are in the band, and I don't think they had started it yet. And I remember I asked what they did. Josh said he played guitar, and Rob just went like this. And, you know, obviously, he sucks a lot, of, you know. <laughs> so I figured that out pretty quick. And then I think we didn't really like talked to each other for like a year and then I saw Josh at a bank like right down the street from uh, my house and then after that I started going to their shows. I think he told me about the band and then I started going to their shows and then so I kind of like forced myself into there because I remember Alex like one time we played a show at the, they played a show at the Bash on Ash which is non-existent now. I remember it was uh, all their stuff was outside and he wanted to go, I don't know what band it was, but he wanted to go see a, a band and I was watching, I, I offered to watch the stuff and then I think it kind of just went from there. Just like, I kept forcing myself in there. So, if you want to be like, hanging around a band, just, you know, get in there like on your first date. And then, that's pretty much how it worked. Like, I just kept doing that. They pretty much had to be my friend. They're like, that was pretty cool. Uh, you were on their first tour. Yeah. Uh, how did you get roped into that, and what did you think? How, what was your experience on that tour? I think I offered because they needed uh, someone to watch merch, so I was just like, I didn't want to work. I'm lazy. I don't want to work for nobody else, so I worked, did it for them for nothing. I mean, really, I, you know, they fed me. They took me all over the U.S., so you can't even complain. Jimmy Grant. That's me. This time last year, you were getting ready to go on the first annual Holiday Hate Tour, except you were the singer of Endorphin. Yeah. So uh, tell me about that band and uh, I guess the, the public version of why or how you ended up in Psycho Stick. Uh, let's see here. We, uh, at the point that we did the Holiday Hate Tour, should I not be like looking at the camera? Should I be looking? You when I talk, I don't know what to yeah, do. Look at the camera. Hands. The camera uh, represents the viewers. All right, so let me see. At the point that we did the holiday hate tour, we had just lost what, three of the five members of Endorphin, and then replaced two of those three members. So it was already on shaky ground, and uh, we did the holiday hate tour, which turned out to be pretty damn successful for Endorphin. You know, like, I'm sure it was pretty successful for Psycho Stick as well, obviously. But uh, as soon as we came back, we lost a drummer again, you know. And, and at that point, it was just too shaky. I mean, like, I can't, I can't put my future personally into something that's that shaky. Then I get a call from Alex saying, you know, that he heard, heard there was trouble in paradise, and this and that. And so they uh, needed a bass player and, you know, and, I happened to be able to play bass as well, so like uh, it worked out well for everybody, I guess, you know. Now I'm in a comedy band, which is what, you know, Endorphin was so close to being a comedy band anyway. That's why we did so many tours with Psycho Stick. So, I mean, it's a it's, uh, perfect fit for my stupid ass personality, yeah. All right, we're here with Jaegermeister. 
the second to latest addition to the Psycho Stick lineup. Now for those of you who don't know, which I would imagine is most of you, Jake has a very unique role in Psycho Stick in that he is on the beer song uh, from the first album. Jake, tell us about that experience, how you got involved. Well, I've actually known Psycho Stick for quite a long time because I was in local bands when they just started out. So we were playing shows with them at the very beginning. Uh, I was in a band called Wisdom of Eternity and we would, you know, hang out with Psycho Stick because they're cool. <laughs> but, uh, now, did you ever ask for an autograph? No. Okay. They weren't rock stars when I knew them. <laughs> they waited until you joined. Yeah, they waited until I got in the band to do the whole rock star thing, which is cool for me. But yeah, my old band, Wisdom of Eternity, went to uh, either Josh's or Rob's old apartment. I think it was Rob's old apartment. And we did background on the beer song. I'm in that recording along with my drummer and my guitar player from Wisdom of Eternity and a bunch of other local bands from Arizona doing the beer is good, beer is good part on that song. That's why it sounds so big. And the cool thing is Rob's vocal booth was like the most amazing thing I've ever seen. It was basically two by fours constructed into like a square frame and then slung with 30 sleeping bags over the top of it. And it was so fucking hot in that vocal booth. Like Rob almost died recording the, the vocals to that CD. So. Now your history has a lot of marching band uh, uh, in it. Uh, how has that affected uh, your songwriting? Oh well, um, I was in a, uh, I was, in, I was, I played trumpet in high school, and I like it was really into like drum corps, the drum, drum corps drumming, the really rhythmic stuff. So uh, one thing I get told really often is that uh, you know my riff writing is very percussive. Um, so a lot of our songs have very percussive riffs in them. You know, that kind of stuff, like weird rhythms and stuff. Um, another thing that is like, uh, you know, with a, like, a, I also like took, you know, music, years of music theory and like went to college for a few years, like doing music theory, although like, I was, I was gonna be a music major. <laughs> and uh, like I did, just, there's no real future in that because pretty much the only thing you can do in that is, you know, become a pr pr professor that teaches music theory or a band director, which I wanted to do neither. I mean, so, uh, so I like, stopped that, you know, started this band. Um, but, uh, let's see, as far as my musical background, um, one thing I learned about, like, concert and orchestral pieces, symphonic pieces, is that music tells a story. You know, you don't, you know, it's like, if you write a riff, there's got, and you put it in a song, there's got to be a reason that riff is there. You know, it's just not like, hey, that sounds cool. You know, like, you no, know, like, think about the song as a whole and, and fill in the whole, but like, build it around the concept. It's just that, you know, our songs, the concepts are usually stupid. And everything, and you write a song, you go to the song thinking, here's what the feel of the song's gonna be about, here's the vibe. And then from that, it's really easy to like know what kind of riffs to play, what kind of melodies to use, what kind of vocals should be in it. You know, it's like, it just becomes very easy to do. Rather than trying to do it the other way around, which is start with a cool riff, and then try to c come up with a, what the song should be about. That's, that's really difficult. We have a few songs where we, we start, started out with the riffs, and they never turned out as good as the songs that started out with the idea of what the song was about first. Cool. What, uh, what bands are in your iPod that uh, maybe inspire your style of singing? Mm. The bands, I don't know, it's, it's weird with me, it's like, with the, with the styles of singing, I really didn't try to mimic any style of any other artist. I mean, I had, I had uh, singers that I really like, or have singers that I really like, like uh, LeJean from Seven Dust and, and uh, Rob Flynn from Machine Head and, you know, uh, Brandon from Incubus, Old Incubus, you know, science, that's amazing. And a lot of those guys are, are inspired me, per se, but I, I don't try to sing like them at all. I don't really have influences, I don't think. I try to just sing where I feel comfortable. And, um, but I, I was inspired by those guys in particular. They called me, they're like, I got this song. I wrote it, it's about beer. They read me all the lyrics till the very end. 
and they asked me what I thought the last line should be. And I'm pretty sure I said it immediately. I didn't even have to think about it. It's, let's go drive a car. <laughs> and that made them laugh even harder. And so that was it. That was the lyric for the song, not knowing that by doing that, we probably totally killed our chances in getting it on, you know, serious radio play or anything like that years later, but I don't really care because I think it's funny. So, but that does not mean that we, you know, endorse drunk driving. I think that's absolutely ridiculous. So, just so you know, from my mouth, drinking and driving is retarded. And you are retarded if you drink and drive. So tell me about your style. Who are some of your influences? Travis Barker's number one. He's my favorite drummer ever. He's, yeah, across the board, he's the best in my opinion. And Brain is another big one. I really like the drumming style of the dude from Dillinger, Escape Plan, and the guy from Suga. Both those guys are really good. And then uh, Abe Cumming uh, Cunningham from uh, Deftones. And Dave McLean from Machine Head. I'd say that's a good round. A bunch of people. So. Tell me about your choice guitar. The guitar I really want? Yes. I would love an ESP Viper Custom. That's what I want. Why? They play great. The neck feels great in my hands. I love to stroke it. I love to strum it. Uh, their body style is actually pretty unique and cool. I like it a lot. And uh, they're light, so it won't hurt my neck being on stage for hours and hours. <laughs> Rock and roll. I also played the kazoo. So uh, anybody out there needs a kazoo player for, for some tracking or something, just give me a call. <laughs> right, freelance studio work you're doing? Yep. Cool. Uh, being an endorphin, you know, you, won't, you played bass on the one song, so there's a a lot of people, including myself, were just kind of like, what, Jimmy plays bass, like, for real, for real? And it turns out you're extremely talented at the instrument. Uh, so just saying that because I can see you. That's true. And the viewers at home will probably be disagreeing with me at this point, but give us a little bit of background on uh, your, uh, you know, what made you... My amazing a abilities? Yeah. Uh, well, the thing is, is when... In the inception of Endorphin, when I was shit, when I was like 16, 17, I was never supposed to be the singer. Me and I, like, I played guitar. I wanted to be Jimi Hendrix, you know, and uh, and that was a huge deal for me was learning the instrument of guitar. And I kind of got like pushed into that that limelight type situation, pushed into the singer situation. Which, you know, I fully embraced. I mean, it was another instrument, you know, so let me try it. But the whole time that I was playing guitar and or, you know, playing guitar and singing, uh, our original bass player would leave his bass over at my house all the time. And I always had this uh, this thing that I, that I always told the guys in our band, and it was like, if I could slap like Les Claypool or Flea or something, that's all I would do all the time is just slap bass. So when he started leaving his bass over at my house, obviously as another instrument, I picked it up and started playing it. And you know, it's like this this need to know for me. It's like a need to know every instrument that's being played and really how it's being played in the band. And then I can, you know, then whenever I come up with an idea or, or go to our bass player, singer, you know, or whatever, and I ask them, you know, hey, can we do something like this? I, I know what it's actually involved in doing that. I'm not asking the impossible out of these guys, you know. It's like, if I can do it, you can fucking do it, <laughs> you know, like that type of situation. But, you know, the, for me, it, it just seemed like a necessity to, to know, you know, exactly what everybody's playing and how you know, how difficult and simple it is that they're doing, you know. Uh, since uh, being in Psycho Stick, you have acquired several endorsements. That's true. Let's talk about those. Who do you got, and uh, what is it about that product that makes them uh, enticing to you? Well, the first endorsement I ever got, I'm not going to say the name because the guy turned out to be kind of a dick, but uh, uh, they were free. So that was cool. I got free sticks for a while. And then I met the guy and decided not to work with him anymore. And then about a week later, I was in Cincinnati and met the guy from 
Endway, and he got me in touch with Silver Fox, and yeah, these guys. And uh, they did been great to me. Awesome sticks, awesome people, just a killer company. And since then, I've talked to Zildjian for a while, and I don't really have a full endorsement just yet, but I'm working with the company. I'm building a relationship, and that's that's been really good so far. They've been really cool to me. And that's it so far. But so, I'm working on a couple new ones. Okay, now in getting these sponsorships, uh, what requirements did the bands or did the companies have for you that may help other bands in getting endorsements? Most of the time, they want to see that you're touring or at least playing a bunch of shows. You know, at least a few a month. I mean, a lot. So you can't really do that in your town and play all the time and have people actually come out. So touring is kind of a necessity, and you have to obviously be able to play your instrument. <laughs> you have to be decent at that at least, and. You know, you can send them your songs, the video, the touring, you know. If you send them a press kit, like a solid press kit that's professionally done, and you know, you don't have a bunch of misspelled words in the cover letter and stuff like that, just get them a bio, get them your CD, and, you know. It's pretty simple, you just have to know how to talk to people. Once you get in touch with them, don't call them every day. Like, hey, give me an endorsement. Just, uh, I talk to Zildjian once every month or two for about six months before I got something going, so. You have to be persistent, but not annoying. They don't want that. They want, you know, you know, good musicians that are actually going out there and doing this for a living. But you know, they don't want a bunch of. They don't want to give you a bunch of free shit for no reason, either. They definitely want a reason to give you something, you know, at cost or whatever. Like, uh, um, basically, support their company and they'll support you too. That's kind of how it works. Now, as far as a comedy band goes, uh, there are hundreds and hundreds of comedy bands out there, kids in high school starting bands like this. What is it about Psycho Stick that has allowed the band to excel beyond what most comedy bands can do? Well, um, we're a comedy band, but we take the music and the business aspect of it very, very, very seriously. I mean, uh, that's why we, on our first record we put a lot of time into making sure that it sounded really good. Because uh, you know most you know comedy bands that put a record, it sounds it sounds like it's done in their garage or something, and, and people are like, ah, that's funny, but you guys are just you're just just, you're just goofing around and not gonna go anywhere. So you gotta let people know that you're serious about being stupid. Okay. Uh, now you and Rob are responsible for the beer song. Uh, give us a little bit of information, a little background on that. We both actually worked the same job for a while, doing web design kind of work, and we had a cubicle right next to each other, and then like one like slow day, he and I were really bored, and we just came up with this really terrible poem about beer, and we were like, hey, we should like make this in a song, and, like make it like with a horrible background, and, and just, and then we wrote it in 15 minutes. It's like, yes, if we actually played it, we didn't think it was actually going to become a song, and we played it like, hey, this is actually kind of cool. And, uh, yeah, it's kind of an accident. Of course, most of our best songs started as like, huh, you know, like some seemingly really bad idea that when taken to extreme somehow becomes a good idea. A lot of people would like to know how uh, the band has achieved success via XM Radio. Why don't you share the viewers that story? Well, there's a lot of little details that I don't know. But from what I understand, there's a guy in France. His name is, uh, I guess the, 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 Fr the American equivalent of his name would be Michael. And in France it's like Michel or something like that. And he discovered us, I don't know, probably just by surfing around on the internet. And he is friends with... Um, uh, Evil J's brother, and Evil J is the basis for OTEP. And then Evil J's brother, you know, they, you know, him and Michelle were talking, and they're like, "Oh, hey, this is a bad cycle stick." And then, you know, checked it out and liked it, and then kept trying to get Evil J to listen to it. And Evil J going, yeah, yeah, yeah. "Sorry, Evil J, but this is what you told me." And um, after that, he, uh, Evil J, finally listened to it. And, liked it and loved it, whatever, it became, I think Evil J is probably our biggest fan, you know, it's a really big compliment and everything, and 
Evil J let uh, Guys and Slipknot here in, and Guys and a bunch of other big bands here while he was on Ozfest. And then there was an instance when he was um, at XM Radio and passed our disc along to one of the DJs there. And um, yeah, that's pretty much how it happened. And then they just started playing the beer song because they liked it, I guess. Who likes that song? Now, uh, you guys have quite a following in Minneapolis mm -hmm. and you credit that mostly to a show you did with another band opening up. Uh, what was that band and how did that get arranged? The, um, the, two, the two bands we opened up for at The Myth were Army of Anyone and Three Days Grace. And we got put on the show because of, of a radio thing that was going on between uh, Rock Ridge and the radio station there. And um, it was a total radio deal, and I think Saliva was going to play that spot, if I remember right. And they canceled or went and did something else, I don't know. So they put us on the bill, and it was very, very lucky. It was pretty much a luck move, but I'm not a big believer in luck. I think it was meant to be. So thank you, Saliva, for not playing the show. <laughs> So, going from singer to bass player, uh, how do you, what, what's the mentality that goes into that? Like, all of a sudden you're the center of attention, front man, and now, you know, that's... Nobody hears me at all. Yeah. Right. Uh, you know, there, there's a huge uh, ego thing. Me and me and Rob do this all the time, you know? I'm like, you know, maybe I should sing this song, and Rob's like, no, no, and, you know, maybe, maybe you should play bass, Rob. Maybe I should front the band from now on. And, Rob's like, no, you know, so like, uh, there's still a little shit to be worked out. I'm fully kidding, by the way. Like, uh, to me, it's fun, man. I mean, I, I can sit back. I don't have to, you know, I know the responsibilities that comes with being a front man. And, you know, it is, it's a lot of fun, but it's also kind of a lot of fun to sit, you know, sit back in the background and point and laugh at Rob and know that Rob has all those responsibilities now, <laughs> you know? How was uh, the pre-production of the album for you? Your first writing session with Psycho Stick, stuff like that. It was really good, actually. It was just tons and tons of laughs, and the ideas just kept flowing. Didn't really seem to be an end to the ideas, although a lot of them are about food, but I guess you write what you know, and. This band knows food. So. Well done. Uh, this time last year, uh, were you in a band? Yes, I was. Tell me about that band. This time last year, I think I was in a band called Whiskey Driven. I've been in so many bands that I don't know which one was which, but Whiskey Driven, that's a bunch of original stuff that I wrote, acoustic stuff um, that I sang as well, played guitar on. Had some friends backing me up. MySpace.com backslash whiskey driven too. <laughs> a lot of people, uh, I think most people, fans of the band, do not know that you are an avid reader. Couldn't they tell by? <laughs> yeah, yeah, dude. Books are books are the best movies. You know, the library's like free blockbuster to me. <laughs> what uh, What are you reading now? Uh, dude. You don't. You don't even want to know. Chuck. Uh, Chuck. Whatever the guy's name is, the guy that wrote Fight Club. I just read a short story from this guy. That's uh, from a book called Haunted, and it is literally probably the most disturbing thing I've read. Like every fucking Stephen King book, you know, in existence. This is the most disturbing thing I've ever read ever. It's like. Something about some kid who swims to the bottom of a pool to jerk off and then sits on a recirculation pump and sucks his guts out through the... Oh, God. Was, you know, I have, to, I have to spread that along because misery apparently loves company, so... But. So anyone who sees you perform will notice that your snare does not match the set. That's very true. I'm not a punk-ass bitch. Do you know any punk-ass bitches? I know a lot but I'm sure they wouldn't like it if I called them out on DVD. So, um, yeah, there's a bunch of them out there. If your snare comes with the drum set that you buy, no, 
just get a new one, man. You can get a new, like a solid snare, like a pearl even, just anything for a hundred bucks, you know. That sounds better than anything that comes with a set. So, it's a much better decision. How has Psycho 6 survived uh, this long, being a touring unit uh, with all of the stress that comes with being in a band? There's a lot to be said for determination. If you really want something to work, really make do with what you have. Even though you have no money, barely enough food, thousands and thousands of dollars in debt, your van, you know, potentially could be breaking. I mean, ours didn't, but our trailer did quite a bit on the last tour. Uh, why don't you play the dumb song live? Hmm, that's a good question. Well, the dumb song never will be a psycho stick song. The reason why the, there's confusion is on LimeWire. Yes, I know about LimeWire. Um, they got, there's a guy who downloaded the dumb song off of Plo.com, which is a website that I run, sort of. <laughs> and uh, got it all mixed up because Josh is in the dumb song with our friend Murph. And because, you know, Josh's voice is very recognizable and you'll hear Josh's voice also on a lot of Psycho Stick songs. So I think that's where the confusion came from. And so the guy put it up on LimeWare as a Psycho Stick song. And now the whole world thinks it's a Psycho Stick song, even though it's not. And uh, that's why we don't play it live, because it's not our song. Now I know that Josh and Murph finished recording an entire album recently. And Josh is busy working on Sandwich right now, so he hasn't gotten around to it, but they did redo the dumb song, or made it better, or something like that, just so that we clarify everything. And when, that's, when that album comes out, hopefully, although I may be hoping a little too much, that there will be no more confusion. Good answer, huh? Very good, yeah. very good. <clears throat> Getting sick, <laughs> elaborate. On the first tour, I, I don't even know how far into the tour I was. It was like, what? A week or two, two weeks, something like that. About two weeks. About two weeks into the tour, everything is awesome, and then all of a sudden, like, I start getting pink eye, and I had pink eye in both of my eyes, which killed my immune system and got me sick. I was throwing up, had a fever, you know, shitting, puking the whole nine yards. It was all that stuff at once for like a whole week. I was stranded in like a hotel room somewhere in New Mexico, and you know. Being the good guys that they are, Psycho Stick like did my laundry for me and got me medicine and stuff. Let me sleep in the bed, which is really awesome. <laughs> so thanks, guys. Because <laughs> who gets the bed? That's always you know you never know who's it's getting iffy. it. We're usually sharing a bed for all you ladies. <laughs> uh, two in the bed, three on the cots. Yeah, two on the floor. Or if, if we get lucky and it's a double bedroom, there will be two in each bed and then like three on the floor, four on the floor, something like that. So, <clears throat> no, but it was fun though. It was a good experience for, what was it, like three months? Right. The first tour was three months. Yeah. Like three months straight and like, it was just crazy. The one thing I like about when I go on tour and I come back, there's always this assumption that you do drugs, you have sex with random girls like all the time. Cause like I went to, I went back to the fries and everybody's like, so, how many girls did you go with? I'm like, <laughs> I just like, I'm not like that. I was just it. It was just funny the cliches. Everybody, they're like, oh, you do drugs, you drink all the time. <laughs> Nothing we do. So what do you think about the the cliche? Everyone assumes that Psycho Stick, the beer band, they must drink beer. I think it's funny because like they drink beer, but they don't drink it like college kids do. I don't think they really did that much. But it's just funny because everybody's like, oh, you guys don't drink beer, and they get all, you know, sad about it. And it's like, you know, someone that writes a song about drugs, they're not gonna, you know, do drugs all the time. Something like that. I'm gonna write a song about socks. Because I wear socks. I wear socks. <laughs> oh, because he hates socks. I have to write a song. I guess uh, an obvious question should be, uh, what is behind the, the Superman uh, costume, <laughs> stage, persona? You know, I could, uh, I could give you a bunch of bullshit answers, but the, the, the real answer to that is that I've always found it amazing, it's just the, the psychology behind Superman, that he, you know, he went out, 
performed these, you know, uh, more than human tasks. He always performed these superhuman tasks. Uh, but then, after he performed those tasks, he went back to become being Clark Kent. There was this dual personality, and it's something that always like felt like it kept me grounded that no matter what I did if I was going out and performing on stage that's why you know this is generally not a thing like usually I, I wear it on stage because that's when I perform what I consider my superhuman task or whatever but like uh, but regardless as soon as I step off that stage I'm still Clark Kent you know you have to be able to balance those two worlds and realize that you're not Superman you know you're also Clark Kent, you might do this, but no matter what, whenever you come home, you know, you're going to end up playing Final Fantasy, reading Hitchhiker's Guide, you know, it's, yeah, I, I am equally the nerd of Clark Kent that I am, you know, the, the, the amazingness of Superman, you know. So you're, you're like Clark Kent who just wears the Superman costume all Pretty the time. Pretty much, yeah. Okay, that's cool. Yeah, um, I'm Clark Kent who plays bass. Oh, Jägermeister Love Song, that is you. You are the lyricist behind that song. I wrote the entire song. I wrote the music and the lyrics. Tell me about it. Well, that was one that I... I kind of stole the ending from the banner. I didn't realize it at the time, but I was listening to them a lot at that point. And uh, the chug, chug, chug part, that's taken straight out of a song off Each Breath Haunted. So I'm sorry, guys, but it's kind of stolen from you. But that just means I like you a lot. <laughs> But I was writing that song because I thought it'd be kind of funny to have a mock love song. But halfway through realizing that I didn't really care about the love song, just writing it about Jägermeister instead. And so I thought that would be funny, and then we made the music and everything. I wrote the music for it and played that for Josh, and uh, he thought it was cool and actually made it a little bit better. He elaborated on the parts that I wrote on guitar. Because I'm sort of a guitar player, but he's a real one, so he can actually write better stuff. So he fixed it a little bit, made it a little bit better, and then the end of it has a pun in it. So if anybody doesn't get the joke, listen to it again and think really hard about it. The chug, chug, chug part. Think really hard. Well done. So that was fun to record, though. Uh, going back to the first tour real quick, uh, what do you recall was the first moment where you were just like, okay, this is real? What do you mean real? Like just uh, something something that may have happened where you just thought, okay, I'm really in a band that's really doing it, really touring. Probably a couple of the, well, actually that first show in Odessa, Texas was the very first show I ever played with Psycho Stick and it was insane. Like I was really nervous. I wasn't moving around on stage a whole lot, um, but it didn't matter. Those kids were nuts. They just loved the band no matter what. And there's other shows like Sioux Falls, uh, what is that, South Dakota? Yes. Fucking amazing show. That show, I was like, yeah, that's the shit that I want to do. And then obviously we've gone on to do bigger stuff like the Mayhem show. And hopefully this next tour will be full of huge shows like that, which is always a good goal. Money, money, money. <laughs> <laughs> Smooth. I got a phone call. Let's see who it is. You know what? I think a good tour would be. Uh, it's Rob. The cows and galoshes. Hi, Rob. The guy which is interrupting this interview. Damn singers, interrupting everything. Think they're like the center of the universe. Yeah, hey, try living with one. Yeah, I did. <laughs> How was that experience? We'll compare notes. Actually, yeah, we got along pretty well. I like to say that like there's like crazy stuff that happened, but actually Rob and I are just like, you know, we're like both like really hardcore introverts, so we come home like, hey, what's up, man? Hey, what's up? Okay, well, I'm gonna go play video games now. I'm gonna go surf the internet. Later. And that was that. So what if Josh decided not to move out here? Would you have moved back to Odessa? No. Nope. You gotta understand at the time, um, the idea of the band taking off was like, not even conceptual, you know? It was like, we were just messing around. It was just something we were doing for fun. And Josh wanted to get out of Odessa because there was pretty much no music scene for rock there at all. It's all country, you know? As far as I know, could have changed, but 
Um, so he just wanted to get out of there. And I, I, I was the guy who convinced him to move because when I, I was moving from uh, Albuquerque to Austin, I stayed there for a couple of days and I talked to him. I was like, dude, you gotta get out of here. There's nothing going on here. I was like, yeah. So he did it. And props to him because that was not easy. He loaded up his car and drove to Phoenix. And he had car trouble on the way, I think. Hey, what year was this? 2000. Early 2000, I think. Now, obviously today there's uh, no example to be given, but normally you, you put your hair up. Yeah. And people ask about it, and I guess, uh, you know, what? how did that get started? What was the inception? <laughs> there was, that was, uh, everybody seems to think there's this this awesome story that goes with it it was actually just the longest running accident of a haircut you could ever expect to have from you know ever like it started out remember the uh, the uh seventh grade bully metallica haircut where it's shaved on the sides you pull it back into a ponytail like that was what it was originally supposed to be but then like uh what happened was it was too short when it started out so in order to be able to perform shows, I just kind of pulled it up and kept it out of my eyes, you know, and, and over a period of time, I just kept adding rubber bands, and it was like, oh, it's this little thing that sticks off the top of my head, and after a while, it just kept going up, I mean, and, and kept going up, and it eventually became kind of like rings on a tree, where it's like, you know, I remember back here when we started out, you know, like, this is where we picked up Tanner, this is where we picked up Adam, this is where... Endorphin broke up. This is where Psycho Stick began, you know, and it just keeps going. I mean, there's a, a like it's it's got this whole chronological order to everything that's happened, you know. Okay, so when the band gets famous and they ask you the same questions I asked, will you give them the same response? Absolutely. <laughs> You're like, look, dickhead. <laughs> you have to. You, you have to cut all that out, you know that, right? Yeah, I know. But it's fun just to have. <laughs> Anthony is not your friend. That's right. Anthony is a camera. Is a camera. <clears throat> so at what point did the band decide to start taking itself seriously and touring? Well, on some level we always took ourselves seriously. I mean, we were spending a lot of our free time just, you know, rehearsing and and just trying to play shows around here, get some sort of following. I mean, we're all serious. That's a big misconception, you know, a lot of people think that because we're a comedic band, we're just like, ooh, all the time. But 90% mm -hmm. of the conversations we have are like, okay, what do we got to do next? How do we get, you know, step one, step two, step three? And uh, what's the other part of the question? Uh, touring. Touring. When oh, touring. Start, start touring. Uh, the touring thing didn't really start happening, or didn't even become an, uh, possible until we started getting XM Radio Play, which was in 2000, late 2005. And um, part, of, part of the problem with Phoenix, it's so isolated from any other large city. You know, LA is like a good five, six hours away, you know, and the other closest one would be San Diego or Albuquerque or something like that, and they're all like way out of the way. So you, it's not easy to get big regionally because this Phoenix is pretty much the only region in Arizona. There's smaller towns here, and there's Tucson, and that's about it. So, so we when we went out on our first tour, we drove all the way to Kentucky for our first show on our first official tour. So, which you can. Uh, watch on the DVD. Yeah. <laughs> How are the women? I wouldn't know. <laughs> Good man. People think that like bands just are debaucherous, but we really we don't have time to meet chicks. We don't have time really to get drunk. If you get drunk, you know, the night before you're definitely paying the price by riding in like a hot van for nine hours to the next city, and then by the time you get to the next city, you know, you better not be hungover because you're expected to do a lot. That, that sucks to be really drunk and messed up on drugs while trying to do something that's so taxing in itself already. What? 
there anything else you'd like to say to the fans? Buy our album so that, you know, I can have money. <laughs> what do you got in your pockets now? Me? I got a key to Tony's house, uh, cigarettes, cigarettes, phone, a lighter, and a paper towel. I like beer cause it is good I drink beer because I should If there was a song to sing I sing it and beer you drink I drink beer when I am sad Cause the beer it makes me glad Now there's nothing left to say So let's go drink beer Beer is good! Beer is good! Beer is good! And stop! Beer is good! Beer is good! Beer is good! Let's go drink some beer!
while a lot of terrible bands are going to be recording a lot of terrible albums because their parents have a lot of money. We're writing a song, a special song. It kicks ass, right, Jimmy? Yes, it does. But we don't have any lyrics yet because the lyrics are going to be your name. $50, you can get your first and last name in the lyrics of this song. And when the CD comes out, you get a signed copy of the CD. So for $250, you can get your business name in the verse of our song. There's only 25 of those spots left, so you better hurry up and grab one. This song with your names will be on the new album. You guys that cycle stick band? Yeah! You do that beer song, right? Yeah. Hey guys! Look, it's cycle stick! Yeah! You guys must be billionaires or something. We are not billionaires! Hey Rob, can we get that new Ingle Special Edition rack mount preamp for the recording? I'm sorry, Jake, we. We can't afford it. But you promised! Promised! Okay guys, for the recording, we need to buy that VHT amp, uh, we need that uh, BB Sonic Maximizer, we need a new DI box for the guitars uh, so, so we can reamp, and we need uh, that Waze plug-in so, so Rob's voice sound really present and full. So, everybody, see what we got. Uh, I think we need more. Complete failure. submitted for a contest to fly you and a friend out to our CD release party. The goal to cover all the costs for recording a CD for you is $23,000. To follow the progress of our album fundraiser, please go to psychostick.com slash new album, all one word. Hi, I'm Rob from the band Psycho Stick. You may have heard us through such songs as Two Ton Paperweight, The Jägermeister Love Song, In a Band to Get Chicks, A New One, Jolly Old Sadist, and of course, <laughs> this one. Beer is good, beer is good, let's go drink some beer! We are in beautiful Phoenix, Arizona today at Toxic Recording Studios where we recorded our latest CD, to bring you a tutorial on how to set up your music for sale on your MySpace page via Snowcap. Now the best way to approach this is to be very calm. Why Jay, whatever's the problem? I want to make billions of dollars using the internet to sell my music, but I don't know how to set up a Snowcap account. <laughs> Worry not my friend. That's why I'm here. 
First, find a computer. Ah, there's my computer. And then make sure you're plugged into the internet with that computer. Open up your browser and go to snowcap.com. This requires one of those internet connections we talked about earlier. Chances are, if you're watching this video, you've got one. Next, click on Sign Up. This will allow you to <gasps> sign up for Snowcap. The artist account sign up form appears. You'll have to agree to their legal stuff but it's standard and harmless for you war rewards out there. All right, it's time to enter your account information. Almost all of the fields are required, so make sure you get as much filled out as possible. Now you'll have to enter your credit card info. This is mostly just for verification. They will not charge you for anything, so don't worry. There's also an option to enter your social security number for verification, but the credit card information is there. Either way, we're not showing our credit card information because we're dumb, but not that dumb. That funky image with all the garbled letters is Snowcap's way of saying, hey, you're not some spam bot that wants to be all stupid and ruin the internet. Next, you'll get a super polite thank you. Yay! Now you must check your email. You should have a new email from Snowcap Customer Care since you are now a customer and they care. Click on the link to activate your account. Then log in with your email address and newly created password on snowcap.com. Hooray! You're an uber ton closer to selling your music through Snowcap. Wow! Provided that your band name doesn't conflict with Snowcap's big band database, you'll be set. If for some reason there is a conflict, follow Snowcap's frequently asked questions FAQ to get help. Next, you must upload your tracks. Go to Upload on the top bar there and select your artist name, file type, then click Add Files. Browse for the music file on your hard drive provided you did go through that entire recording process. Then select Start Upload. Your file will then be uploaded as indicated by a status bar. Repeat until all the songs you want to sell are uploaded. Once you're done uploading your awesome songs, click Next. You'll then get to name your tracks. Wow, amazing. Click Next once you've successfully named all of your songs. Now you must set up the prices to sell your songs. Snowcap takes a cut for the service they provide, and rightly so. You can also select two other online retailers to sell your music through, if you like. Click Next once you're done. Now you're done. Click done to be done. You're not really done just yet though. That is, if you're ready to sell your music on MySpace. That is why you're here, right? Of course you are. Now you must go to MySpace.com and log into your artist account. I'm going to go out on a limb here and assume you know how to do this. Once logged into your MySpace account, on your main account screen, find a link called Create Your MySpace Music Store. It might not show up on the classic view, so make sure you've switched to the new home skin view. It has prettier buttons and stuff. Now click on that Create Your MySpace Music Store link. Now you'll get a page with some encouraging text. How nice! Read all of that if you want, then click on Set Up My Store. You're suddenly whisked back to Snowcap. Calm down, this is a good thing. Next you're asked to log in or sign up. We've already signed up, haven't we? Yes, we have. So make sure your Snowcap email and password are entered under Already Registered and click Go. Now it'll ask you if you want to embed your music store on your MySpace page. Well of course you do or you wouldn't be here. Make sure, yes, place this store on my MySpace profile page is selected, then click on Continue. Now between a few minutes and a day or so, your store will appear under your MySpace playlist. If it hasn't yet, give it some time and keep checking back. 
Now you're done. You're on your way to potentially becoming a multi-billionaire selling your music through MySpace and Snowcap. Yay! Well now, from Psycho Stick to you, and everything that courses through our veins, and all the stars in the galaxy, and all the little grass blades that grow out of the ground, we would like to thank you for watching this video today on how to set up your Snowcap account on your MySpace page. It is with great pride and honor that we have been selected to bring this to you. And we hope with everything that is in the universe and up and below and in the rocks and the sea and the sky and the fishies and the bears that you are satisfied and have a successful endeavor in making money via the internet through your MySpace page through Snowcat. Thank you, thank you so much. And have a wonderful and prosperous day. Good night and farewell. Cycle Stick Street Team, aka The Dumb, orientation video. The key to being a successful promoter on The Dumb is to remember where to go to promote. Concerts, tattoo shops, music stores. How do you promote? Being enthusiastic, being proactive, all this is very hard to remember. So we came up with an all-encapsulating acronym known as Dad Get Muff Hump It. Determination. <laughs> Aggressive. Book stores, you know, comic book stores, video game resale stores, video game stores in general, any place like that, anime stores, basically just go in and ask, hey, can I put this poster up here? Or may I set some flyers on the counter? Worst they could say is no. wearing band shirts. This can actually be a pretty good way to promote. Say you're at Taco Bell and you see a guy wearing a Slipknot or a mud vein or a hate breed shirt, just break the ice and start asking about that band, start talking to him about it. And then you can, actually, we made a video that can explain it better than I can. Roll the clip. Dude, fuck yeah, damage plan. It's all about dying bag, man. You like metal? Yes, I do. Have you heard of Psycho Stick? No, I haven't. You haven't? Well, have you heard that Beer is Good song? It goes, Beer is good, Beer is oh, good. Oh, yeah, 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 yeah. I heard that, that song. That's, that's Psycho Stick, man. That song kicks ass. The, yeah, man. You should go to their show. They're playing here really soon. Oh, sweet. All right. Hope to see you there. It's going to kick right. your ass. Oh, yeah. I'll see you guys there. All right. Enthusiasm. Tattoo shops. Go to your local tattoo shop and leave posters and or flyers if they'll let you because tattoos and metal go hand in hand. MySpace. There are many ways to promote on MySpace. You have bulletins. Post bulletins. Put flyers on your MySpace page. Have your friends do the same. You can also post comments with the flyers on there and also have your friends do the same. music scene. Basically, if you know anybody that plays in a local band, then those are great places to hand out flyers to shows. Um, 
pretty much any metal rock concert that has less than a thousand people at it. Um, you know, websites, underground music magazines, if you can somehow get shows listed in those, good thing to do. Facebook. There are many ways to promote on Facebook. You can become a fan on Psycho 6 official Facebook page. That's a start. Then you can post flyers on your friends' walls, also putting flyers in your picture, your photo albums, so people can see the flyers from there. And they also get that notification whenever you add, they'll see the flyer. It's another great way to do it. Fantastic. Head shops, you know, places that sell water pipes for smoking tobacco. Oftentimes they have areas where you can leave flyers or posters, especially if you know someone who works there. Hey, how are you? You always have flyers on you. Go to the show. Music stores, you know, especially those little underground ones that will are more likely to special order CDs for you. They know the cool record stores. Well, very often they'll have like places you can put up posters or places you can leave flyers. And if not, ask if you can. What well, could it hurt? Proactive. Let me give you a hand with this. Internet. There are many places to promote shows on the internet, such as local music websites, forums, calendars. The entire thing is your playground to help promote shows, especially in your area. So give it a shot. Just don't spam too much. And don't spam, because that's stupid. Determination, aggressive, dork stores, guys and chicks wearing band shirts, enthusiasm, tattoo shops, MySpace, underground music scene, Facebook, fantastic, head shops, you always have flyers on you, music stores, proactive, internet, thorough. Thank you for watching. We hope you've learned something. Actually, we hope you've learned everything. For additional questions or compliments, please visit thedung.org. Have a wonderful day. Hey. Hey. hey you're you're uh, not Alex. Excuse me, guys. Dan. We just recorded, recorded a whole CD with him. <laughs>
that. I said plus. I know that was terrible, but I'm sure you guys will like it anyway. And uh, I think we'll have some more coming in the near future. So just uh, be watching out for me and Blake. And uh, you should also go check out our band MySpace. Dude, I'm a ninja. At dude, you know, MySpace.com slash dude, I'm a ninja 666. Uh, we haven't put any music on there yet because we're trying to get together. But uh, when we do, it's going to be awesome. You guys should check it out. Hell oh, yeah. All right. It's recording. What would you do for a death burger? Aren't they answering? I don't know, just give it a minute. Put down your arms. <laughs> yes, I would like a death burger. Like a death burger. With cheese. With death burger with cheese. And fries. And and the fries. And nachos. And coffee. And combo. And then my muffin. Do you have a death burger or not? Ah, oh, blast it. Then just give me a large cherry limeade. And a large. Mmm. Watermelon. Slush. I'll go somewhere else for a death burger. Okay, you have a large cherry limeade, a large watermelon slice? Uh, can I make that cherry limeade a Route 44, please? Would that be it? That's it. Thank you. And that is what I would do for a death burger. Me too! Tom the Bomb has to face his tag team part of the IW. Oh, no, no, no. What is this? The Bomb Squad has to face off against each other. Your officiated dirty hippie Mac Madness. Alcoholic Mac Madness. How many bits is that? Tom the Bomb showing off the intercons at the gold. Good day, boys. Good day. Good day at the face, face your partner. Have a good day.